This is the 1982 National Farmers Organization Convention in Louisville, Kentucky at the NFO Grain Commodity Meeting. Uh, how many folks remember me from last year? Very good. They made a decision in Corning early this year that they weren't going to allow me to pace. They said, uh, they said the chiropractors made a fortune last year correcting all those neck injuries, if you remember that business. So not only that, but they're really not going to let me speak. Now, you can applaud that too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce a fellow that I've known for many, many years. A uh, pleasure to work with, an inspiration for me, actually, uh, a, a person that I learned more about NFO from. Uh, I don't know anything about NFO, really. Uh, you've forgotten more than I'll ever learn about collective bargaining, about NFO, about the history of the organization. Those of us that are new to the organization don't remember those days. How many people here are charter members in the counties that they represent? Would you please stand up? That goes back many, many, many years, I'm sure, in some cases. Okay. And say, all I can go back is four and a half years, and I think I know it all. <laughs> Ray has had a very busy time. He uh, spent last weekend in Canada addressing the Ontario Soybean Association. Uh, our neighbors to the north have similar problems. And the program today will be presented by Mr. Ray Jurgison. Okay. Thank you, folks. I'm glad to be here. I remember my first convention was 1973 here in Louisville. How many were in Louisville in 1973? Well, it's kind of a reunion. And I remember groups of us going down to see the lease hopper cars that had the big NFO sign on the side. And it was because of the foresight that the members had at that time that enabled us in 73 and 74, 75, later in 78, each time there was a car shortage, that it was those hopper cars that NFO members had the foresight to lease that got us through those tight transportation periods and put extra profits in the growers pockets and it's that kind of foresight that I think has symbolized the efforts that the members of this organization have made for over 20 years. Grain of course is a little younger than the other commodities because it started out with a milk and meat emphasis but in 14 years of grain experience of course we've had to learn a lot and at every every opportunity the membership were those who contributed the ideas that worked for us today. Those, every idea we have that works and puts profits in growers' pockets or, in these miserable times, minimizes losses were ideas that came from the growers. And because there are so many charter members here, for example, today, I feel a little bit awkward. I'm reminded when I was in the service and I got my first duty assignment. And we had to go on the firing range to qualify to find out where we stood in qualification. And I've, well, I'm a fair shot, but I'm not excellent. And the fellow next to me was an excellent shot, except he had trouble with his eyes, and he shot my target too, <laughs> which made me a super excellent shooter. But because the bureaucracy in the Air Force, in this case, is so bad, they wouldn't believe me that somebody else was shooting my target, and I was the best in the squadron. Therefore, every month I had to instruct the rest of the squadron in how to take care of their weapon. <laughs> and most of the other people in the squadron had been in the Korean War or the Second World War. And here I was with about 11 weeks under my belt trying to tell them how to take care of a weapon. So in a lot of ways, when I have a chance to meet so many charter members, I, I feel about the same way that I shouldn't be the one talking. But in any event, as you know, we've, we've faced a rough year in grain. We've taken a couple of punches that we didn't expect because of change in policy that affected market prices. But before I get to that, 
I want to emphasize that what we have here, after 14 years of your work and contribution and effort, is a program for everyone and a program that accommodates changes out there in the marketplace, changes that happen overnight. We're going to talk just briefly about the operation of the regular grain program. We're going to spend a heavy emphasis here on the operation and the sign-up of the National Grain Reserve Block. We have a program for everyone that had to be realigned and was realigned during the year so that we now have three grain centers. But the major grain center is Field Operations Center at Corning, Iowa. From now on, when someone speaks of Corning, Iowa, keep in mind that there are two Cornings. There's a Home Office Grain Department, and that responsibility headed up by Frank Kraft, and there is the Field Operation Corning Office that handles all the business that any other office handles. That is field service for the membership and for the staff in the Grain Department. And at the Corning Field Office, we have for the first time since we went through this restructuring, assembled under one umbrella a bargaining team that's directed by Bob Kessler and has three full-time bargainers and their respective aides sitting in one room. Now that's a long ways from where we were 14 years ago, obviously when we had 40 or 50 grain people bargaining out grain scattered all over the nation. And we couldn't let the left hand couldn't keep track of the right hand. And it was a learning experience, and we have today then the team that operates under one roof. They can exchange intelligence and information and enthusiasm right there in person. Sometimes we miss those things when we operate long distance, bargainers separated. In addition to the grain centers, we have satellite offices in those areas where there's enough enrollment to justify the expenditure. In other words, to build service beyond a certain base point, a satellite office is established, and we'd like to welcome the newest satellite office, which is the second satellite office in the state of Kansas. We had originally opened a satellite office at Salina. The second office was opened just last month at Beloit, Kansas. And it's another demonstration when a group of members decide to go after a particular goal and secure enough production and volume incentive enrollees that they had the base then to open that office. That has sparked interest north on the Nebraska side of the border so that the growers around the Hastings area in Nebraska are saying that they're the next ones with an office given that they're going to go ahead. All the lessons that you and I learned over the years, and of course you learned more than I did because you were there longer and were participating throughout, are the same lessons that we have to keep in mind today. We know that we have volume, we have to have volume to affect markets. We know that we have to have the ability to shift our pattern of movement of the production to cause the buyers to bid upward. And we have to have, most importantly, a program that's flexible enough for all growers. In other words, I can schedule, or you can schedule, any of us can schedule our grain for delivery a year ahead of time and anticipate our cash flow needs by using what we call program marketing. But the best planning we do as individual members, we may have to, at various times, change our cash flow needs. Usually somebody else's changes our cash flow needs for us. In that case, then, we have to have the flexibility of, of an immediate sale. We have that flexibility. We have to have the flexibility to build unit, unit blocks. And for those of you that were at the transportation meeting this morning at 11, you realize how important those unit shipments are becoming now, particularly with respect to deregulation and contract rate availability. In each of these cases, the pro program was designed based on members' particular needs. But most important is the thing I mentioned earliest, I guess, and that's the necessity we have to roll with the punches. And I want to review just one of those that we received this summer. As you recall, in the spring, April and May, there was a lot of question mark about whether or not the corn and soybean growers west of the Mississippi were going to be able to get their acreage seeded. The weather was miserable in Iowa, large parts of Minnesota, Illinois, or excuse me, not Illinois, Nebraska, Missouri, and Kansas. 
And the question mark was significant enough that people in the grain industry were concerned about whether or not the acres were going to get seeded. And there was that doubt until, uh, almost until the last day. But the acres did get seeded, and so that tended to dominate the psychology of the market. However, we watched the pipeline running thinner and thinner and thinner as the summer wore along, and based on the stocks reports, based on the export business at that time, based on the domestic business, we were convinced that into August, that sometime in August, the industry was going to have to jiggle the market a little to bring grain in. In other words, run it up and down several times. However, about the 28th of July, a policy change delivered a punch to that market. And that was the policy change where USDA allowed corn producers who had grain in the three-year reserve to rotate that grain 60 days ahead of harvest instead of 30. And the Secretary, of course, insisted that that should not have adverse market effect. We're all aware, however, of the effect on the market. Don't have to call it adverse, it was just negative. <coughs> okay, it's that kind of reaction that we had to be prepared for. But the bottom line was the more we watched the conditions that existed with respect to the reserve grain and with respect to grain going to market that was not in compliance, we knew that where we really were in terms of grain pricing and grain psychology was back in the 1960s when that cloud of grain in the 60s that hung over the horizon for so long dominated the market to the point we all thought that the world could only afford a buck and a quarter for a bushel of wheat and 90 cents for a bushel of barley. We finally believed that Moses somehow brought that down on a tablet, you know. He broke it and, and somebody else picked it up in the 50s and 60s. Now, the reserve program was designed to keep an isolated portion, a significant portion of the grain off the market so that the grain had to function on the balance of the free stocks. That was the original operation of the three-year grain reserve. However, the change in the rules a year ago, which squeezed the release and call price to the same level, changed the flexibility that the growers had had previous to that time. In other words, under the rules where grain could start going to market at 140% of loan or release level, and that there was 175% call level, there was a range of flexibility that the grower had the opportunity to move in the market and redeem the loan. In other words, get out from under the government loan situation. However, when Congress changed the rules and squeezed those two prices together, all of a sudden, in effect, we have the same thing that we had in the 50s and 60s, which is a price cloud on the marketplace. And that instead of boosting markets upward, the reserve dam, in effect, put a ceiling on that market. And it was because of that, then, that we started discussing with members and leaders throughout the country was there some way, in fact, we could overcome and turn that reserve grain to our advantage? We felt there was because historically it had been NFO members that had had to take the responsibility to make something happen in the market. And every one of you has had in your own areas the opportunity to see at various times, in some cases consistently, that the movement of your production caused favorable upward market reaction. So we had to take a look then was there some way that the reserve, instead of dominating the market and destroying everyone's hopeful thinking, could be turned just the reverse? And so it was with exchange of a lot of ideas from a lot of people that the contract for the formation of a national grain reserve block was started. We first tested that in the water in a test, test kind of way in Colorado. We next tested in Minnesota and finally several other selected areas. And the response of the growers was good. In fact, it was excellent because we had here a plan then was to protect the grower at release level. No one knows when the release level is going to come. It either will arrive because the market conditions have finally gotten that way or because we growers force it to happen by whatever we do with the reserve grain. And as we approached growers, members and non-members alike, they liked the, uh, the logic of the reserve plan. It helped pick up grower attitude. We found a lot of growers around the country had been reading so many newspapers and so many headlines about the market could never recover, 
the situation was hopeless, that in fact a lot of our neighbors had flat given up. And so once people started considering the power of the reserve, if this organized grain, that is grain that the government has organized, was put behind one bargaining voice, and that bargaining voice went to the buyers and sought pre-negotiated contracts for orderly flow of the grain into the market at release level, we would protect ourselves and we would have served the interest of every grower in the nation, whether they were in compliance or not. Then once we started started uh, signing up the actual production in seven states where we decided we had to concentrate because the states of the Dakotas, Minnesota, Nebraska, Kansas, Illinois, Iowa, those seven states have 74% of all the reserve grains. Obviously then we couldn't devote any attention to the states either to the extreme west or south or east for purposes of reserve, that our first energies had to be directed where the bulk of the reserve grain was. Now, since we've been in operation a couple weeks on the reserve, we see that it involves new people more quickly than any other contract we've offered in the countryside. For example, last week I was in McPherson, Kansas, helping some teams that were working down there. I personally had signed there a man in his mid-50s who had never belonged to the organization, who is a very strong Farm Bureau member. That had been his sole organizational involvement over the years with the exception of the Cattle Association, which he also belongs to. So for the first time, he signed 100% of his reserve grain into our reserve block. And his comment afterwards was that no matter what the market did over the years, NFO members have had a plan. And he says, this is the best plan I've ever seen you have. And then he kind of smiled and he says, I suppose the others were just as good. I, just, I didn't study them. <laughs> okay. It was just a matter of time and explanation that man was willing to participate. Now, we also knew that because the prices were squeezed together on the 81 and 82 crop, that we were going to concentrate and zero in on those two reserve crops only grain in compliance in reserve for 81-82, which involves corn, wheat, milo, barley, and oats, were the only commodities that we would put on a special contract. All other grain, grain not in compliance with a government program, or grain not qualifying for reserve such as soybeans, would be handled on a regular contract. We even went so far as to find out precisely the steps we had to take to secure public information. It took a while to convince various ASCS offices at county and state levels, but we got that job done with very few exceptions, that grain in the reserve and the name of the grower who has the grain in the reserve plus the exact number of bushels is public information. It's right in the USDA handbook in black and white. So they couldn't deny us the information. In the state of Michigan, for example, some of the members found there that when they asked for that information, they said, yeah, you want it, and so does everyone else. In other words, if you were in business for building grain bins this last year, you went in and got that information, right? Who's already got grain in reserve because that would be a good candidate to go sell a bin for a new crop? And there were various companies that went and got that information. Now, when we get that information, we don't have the right to the address or the phone number but we do have a right to the name and the total bushels. So Shelley Robertson was named to head up the reserve drive and sends his regrets that personal business this week took him out of town for a couple of days. And Shelley has headed up that drive since it began. We're really just feeling that we're building the momentum and the snowball for the program. I think at this time, for those, because so many of you may not have seen the contract, that if I take a copy of the contract, this one, and read you some of the key provisions here that it would make clear what we intend to do and why we intend to do it. Then it will bring up several points that I will clarify. You will notice, if you've got your glasses on like I, I would need mine on from a distance, that for the first time in a contract we kept most of the lawyer talk out of it. And yet we've designed a contract that protects both the grower, the buyer, the organization, and our neighbors. 
In consideration of like commitments made by other American grain producers, I, the producer, hereby commit the following grain that is presently in the CCC Reserve Program to the National Reserve Grain Block and authorize the National Farmers Organization to sell my grain for delivery whenever the USDA Secretary of Agriculture announces the reserve release. In order to assure orderly flow into market, the National Farmers will use its best efforts to sell all the grain committed by producer at the best price available to National Farmers. If sold, National Farmers will assure that the net return to producer will equal or exceed the amount of producer's obligation for prin principal and interest to the CCC. National Farmers will notify producer in writing after the release announcement as to the sale price, quantity sold, delivery point and delivery dates, schedule of delivery dates not to exceed 12 months after release. Now it means in the meantime several things. Market building through pressure on the market, the size of the block, and delivery at time of release scheduled up to 12 months following release to prevent subsequent market collapse. We already have some close to 3 billion bushels in the National Reserve. There may be as high as 5 billion in reserve by January 30th. That amount of grain obviously can't all be handled at release date. The grower then lists the specific commodity credit loan number, number of bushels, location of the grain, and warehouse receipt if receipted. Then specifies first and second terminal of delivery choice. Then we continue. National farmers will notify a producer prior to release announcement of its inability to sell any or all of the above listed grain, and the obligations of the parties will thereupon terminate with regard to bushels in the notice. For example, if a buyer will take 90% of the grain we offer under the block, then 10% of the grain or 10% of the growers must be notified prior to release that we can't handle those particular bushels. We think, however, that the problem will be the reverse, that whether we offer 600 million or 800 million, any arbitrary figure that an individual buyer will probably want more. If the producer is not now a member of National Farmers, producer agrees to become a limited member, if necessary, for this transaction only, with no rights or obligations other than as stated herein. So for the first time in grain, we have members and non-members walking side by side legally in a plan. In consideration for services received, producer agrees to remit one cent per bushel upon completion of this document. And if a sale is made, producer authorizes national farmers to direct payment of the proceeds of the sale to the National Farmers Trust to be handled under regular trust procedures, meaning guaranteed check and all the rest that we, we know about, and after deduction of 2% to forward the balance of proceeds to the producer. That proceed to be net to pay off commodity credit interest. If release levels are not achieved by the date the reserve expires, in other words, if we never hit the release level in the three-year period, I think some of us are going to be in a little trouble by then, producer is released from his commitment for the bushels involved. If the CCC authorizes the emergency release of the commodity, such as out of condition, the producer, to the producer, the producer is released from his commitment for the bushels involved upon written notification by producer to national farmers. And clearly and concisely, that's the direction of the reserve grain block involving members, non-members alike. The key here is that no matter what has happened in the marketplace historically, it's taken grower response and action to cause something else to happen in the market. And when the growers didn't, didn't take some kind of direct positive action in the marketplace, then the, all the other forces of the market continued to operate at their own happy pace. So that you had price recoveries without farmers' action, but were much delayed and much delayed over the action that you and I took over the years to make markets happen. Now, there may be a number of excuses to not participate in the program you've built over the years. But there is one reason to participate in all of your programs, and that reason is that it's right. I think I'll stop there and ask if there are specific questions, and then we'll resume here. I'll call
call on Jack to help me answer the question. Yes, sir. You mentioned before the USDA handbook on getting information from the ASC office. Right. Do you have to have that number? I believe I got a paper right. stating what page number yes. or whatever. It's hand, USDA handbook 12DS. DS. 12. Certain offices will not give that information out. All right. If a county office will not give you the information, for goodness sakes, don't fight them. And we've had some well-meaning members in places that have, you know, said a few barbed things, and I understand why. But if a county office delays on, or gives you some uh, negative response to providing that list, uh, don't argue. Just call Shelley Robertson at home office, and he contacts then the state ASCS office. USDA Handbook 12DS gives the public clear authority, anybody, a chaplain, a military man, a farm organization, a grain company, can go in and look at that list, have access to it. Yes? Now, down in our county, while the county people down there said that the courthouse had to have the public information, nobody was talking. They must have to turn that over to the courthouse. I think Register of Deeds at the courthouse, in fact, does show at least the name. Now, I don't know if it shows the, I, it may not show the exact loan number, but probably shows the dollar amount and name. Yes. I know I, uh, I rolled in for it, and of course I had to wait a while because this is a rush hour off the rush hour off. Right. But there was a uh, uh, cost involved. They quoted the $88 because it took that many hours, and of course when they finally got it, they cut it in half because they thought it didn't take that long. But, uh, Yes, the ASCS office may charge you, the ideal offices, and there are a lot of those, provide the information free. Some offices may charge you. However, if they quote a figure higher than $50 or $60 for that fee, again, let Shelley know. Because I think the highest one we've actually paid, and that was in a county that had some 22 million bushels of reserve. That's a lot of folks, um, a lot of names. That county costs us, I think, 60. So if you get a, if they quote you too high a price, you better have us check it out. Yes. I don't have the last figure, but it was nudging three billion, right? Two. We just published a newsletter, and I don't have a copy with me because I was gone when it went to press. Uh, as I said, we're close to three, now give or take 100 million. Um, and that if all the compliance acres go into reserve after the first of the year, and there are a lot of growers who are not entering reserve now because they entered their 81 in 82, and they use the loan as income, so after the first of the year, they're entering their 82 bushels in reserve. The possibility exists that as of January 30th, there could be as high as five billion total in reserve, those five commodities. But if you check in the grain office or at the grain booth later tomorrow, we'll give you the exact figures in each commodity. We haven't done personal inventorying of, other than what we talked to among our membership, uh, but you're right. As long as the grain is stored off the farm, as Dan Morgan points out, there's some what he calls leakage. Now, all of the grain is under warehouse receipt that is publicly stored. And if it's moved from one position to another, the local ASCS office, by law, must be told of where that new location is. Now, ultimately, when we come out of the reserve, whether we hit release in April or we hit release 20 months down the road, and once the dust is all settled on the whole thing and somebody writes a book again, they may find out exactly what the leakage was. In the meantime, we know that the U USDA does not have 
at this point at least, what we think is adequate budget to hire enough inspectors, not only to check our farms, but to check public warehouses. But yes, legally and technically, the grain identified under warehouse receipt is there. Now, whether there's a slippage of 50 million or 100 million or X, we would have no way of knowing. Yes? Is it correct that Secretary Block has stated that if your grain is signed on to this contract and it is sold, say, six months after release, that your loan will not be called at the AFTS until your delivery month? Yes, there are rules on that. The calling of the loan, the payment, repayment of the loan following release is a negotiable uh, matter that worked out between ASCS and us. If we notify your respective office of particular loan numbers being paid off or being contracted for later delivery. Yes. And they that, that then imposes responsibility. Yes. No, no. The organization takes that responsibility. Uh, Shelley Robertson has already had the preliminary discussions with USDA and ASCS officials regarding that matter in Washington, D.C. Yes. We've been through it before with other regular release and call grain. And we've had that provision worked out. Yes. Our experience in the beginning has mentioned that uh, it was very easy to get the list uh, not only of reserve grain, but all uh, off the air register. But it does not have the number of bushels. It also indicates whether it's on the farm or if it has to be moved to the warehouse. Uh, wouldn't this at least be a good way to start uh, rather than waiting and paying a uh, higher fee for getting? number of bushels. Uh, most of us are familiar enough with the producers in the county to know where the largest amounts might be. Yes, where you... Right. Where the, the observation was, if at least we get the fellow's name, uh, we'll know where to start. Yes, that's correct. In a county where you have membership widely spread throughout the county, um, not all counties are in that enviable position that there's a member, let's say, every township who pretty well has got a handle. Yes, if you don't have the list and you're talking to a grower, all he has to do is pull out his ASCS forms and all the information you'll need will be right there. Expiration date, loan number, and so on. That you're, yes. Yeah. The only thing that helps, that's really helpful on having the list is that you tend to prevent rat holing. What I mean by that is the grower says, yeah, I'll sign up this bin. Well, then you look at the card and he's got six other bins, right? Uh, where if you didn't have that card, you in fact might know about, might not know about those others. And our goal here is to sign up 100% of the reserve nationwide, and to make that work, we've got to sign up 100% of every, everybody that enrolls. Yes? Yeah, another thing we can do on that is the guy that you pull in his yard and says, no, I'm not the reserve, and you've got him on the list, and just say, well, I'll go down to the AFDS and tell him if you don't have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, <laughs> you have, did, uh, did you hear the observation back there? Okay. Uh, the observation was made here, if, as long as we have the list of people in the county with the loan, and you're driving to a grower's yard and say that you're there to uh, discuss putting power in the marketplace by using the National Reserve, and he says, well, I don't have any reserve, and you know he does, right? And you say, well, I guess I, I can go down and talk to the ASCS about that. Uh, say that with a smile, I suggest. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he might find it, yeah, say, yeah, yeah, I guess I do. Is that what you call that stuff? Uh, <laughs> in Kansas, we had a little joke going there because we got together every night after the drive and there were six, seven teams working. We, of the, as of Tuesday night, of the hundred and some contacts we had, we did have one positive no. And I said to the team, I says, are you sure that guy said no? Well, they said, yeah, we drove up. He was working cattle in the corral, and he came over, and, and we told him what we were doing. He took a bite out of the corral pole. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, it was six-inch well casing. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're going to find a no or two, but uh, by and large, the statistics are overwhelming. Twenty-five percent of those on first contact enroll on recontact run, run beyond 40 percent. And some folks have to be recontacted because they maybe not in a posi position to write a check at that point. Any number of things can happen. Yes? I found unnerving on this list that there's a great number of bushels stored in the county that the owner not, does not live in the county. Yes. That's not the county, outside the county. With certain names, you may have to uh, go outside the county to find, find the person, yes. One's an insurance agent. Right. right. 
Yeah, question over here. Is it correct to say that the 81 Farm Act is the authority that Congress put the release and the call price together? Is that the... Yeah, it's, I think that's the year, but he's... Oh, go ahead, yeah. Yes, so what, what they did is that for the 1981 Review Bond, they established a release of 465, and they also established the call at 465. There's no question there. For 1982, they established the release also at 465, but no call has been established on 82. Okay. Uh, in other words, the secretary's in a high role. But, uh, you know, when you contact some of these guys, and I have already, and, and they, they want to be specific as right. to what act, and uh, I asked at the booth there the other day, and I just want to check that. If you ask them to pull out their 1981 reserve form, the one that they signed at the ASCS office, that one states on corn, for example, release 315, call. 315. Uh, that one states that it. That was part of the compromise uh, uh, on the farm bill that uh, Senator Gold was involved in. That's part of the compromise. In order to get higher reserve <coughs> prices and higher reserve entry prices, they went ahead and compromised 140, 175. Well, in my county, I got my list, and it's off in 79, 75. But we did have over 900 yes. members on the list. Uh, uh, Right. Another advantage of the list is then you start isolating those growers who have significant amounts in the reserve. Let's say you have an hour left in the day to talk to growers, and grower A has 50,000 bushel in reserve, and grower B has 312 bushel in reserve, and there are some of those with very small amounts. It's obvious which grower you're going to spend your time talking to, the significant amount because of your limitation in time, yes. Yeah, so he uh, uh, clears with CCC, yes. Again, would you take the mic to do that? Yeah. No, the certain advantages to the reserve. First of all, interest applies on the first year of the reserve only. The second and third years of the reserve are interest free, so there's no compounding. Additionally, the storage is paid by the CCC annually for the three year period. So what you're talking what you're talking about is the first year of the loan, be that two ninety or whatever it was adjusted to the county on corn plus the interest rate charge for that first year, currently at 11 percent. So th that figure is fixed in there. We, th that's relatively easy to handle. The difficulty comes in areas that are far removed from terminal markets. For example, in South Dakota on corn, in eastern Montana or western North Dakota on wheat, where you're so far from the terminal market that the freight rates are going to make it very difficult to negotiate. But that's once again, is our worry, our concern, and, and what we want to have the problem with. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you're delivering to CCC, yeah. if, if you're delivering to CCC, we don't want to do that, do we? No, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Is interest due after the first year or at the third year? No, it's due when the reserve is released or called or at the expiration of the reserve period. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to uh, notify the state of Illinois <laughs> in that case. I, I can't answer your question. I don't know. I can tell you this. The ASCS offices are definitely busy. Reserve entry is setting a record in almost every county in the nation. Yes, sir. Did they collect interest on the interest after the first No. Right. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
right, but uh, that's going to be your responsibility. Okay. Yes, sir. Something that the uh, NFO could do about the discrimination between the uh, storage between the farmer and the uh, warehouse. The farmers get 26, 26 and a half, and the warehouse gets up to 46. They know how to price their product. <laughs> Not only that, but every state varies. Every state is different. And it's like trying to get uh, uh, universal trucking regulations. Uh, I understand the problem, but please attack that through your district and state organizations in, in the state of Illinois or any other state. Right. Any other questions? One cent per bushel on contract. Yes. The one penny is going to hopefully defray the cost of paper, travel, pre-negotiation, computer programming. You fellas can come and help me, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, is that not two cents on, supposed to be two cents now, isn't it? No, it's one cent on contract, two percent on delivery. That was the change. Initially, we had a one percent on delivery, but... Uh, wouldn't cover the cost of handling the grain in some areas. Yes, sir. I think the number one thing we should be selling on this, if we if we sit here and do nothing on this grain, it's going to be a ceiling over our head. And this right. puts upward pressure on the whole market. Yes. And I think that's one universal thing we should leave with everyone. Right. The sheer size of the, the, the sheer size of the reserve, uh, I didn't know anything about agriculture other than I ate a lot in 1972. And I'm told a lot about 1968 and 1970 when that world price, all the world could pay, was 90 cents, right, for corn. That's all the world could pay. And we were led to believe, right, in 1972, 90 cent corn, dollar twenty-five wheat. You fellas remember that. I don't remember that. All I remember is that in 1973, the world was paying six dollars for wheat. What were they paying for corn? Right? And we allowed that CCC inventory to prevent us from pricing our grain, didn't we? Now let's not let the reserve prevent us from pricing our grain. If we were dealing with a beaver dam, if, if the size of the reserve were so small that we could blast it away with, uh, with just a few good men, fine. But we're dealing with Hoover Dam, and it isn't easy to knock it down. The reserve is a dam on price enhancement. The markets are going to move. There's no question about that. Because we're going to start moving grain into the market, and we're going to start price building again. You've been through that. We're going to do it again, because we have to do that. We have to do it because your neighbor needs help. <laughs> now, I'll explain that. You people care about your neighbor. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But he needs help. So we have to build a market for him. But the only way we're going to get the market beyond the release levels is to make sure the reserve enters the market in an organized fashion. Very important. Any further questions? Yes, sir. Could you clarify that repayment of the reserve? I was under the impression you had so long to pay it off, and you're saying that could be delayed if it's, I mean, if, you know, if it's contracted. Is that something right. you've worked out, or is that Yes, we've been working. We've been working with USDA and CCC, and there'll be an interest charge for that carry. In other words, if it's released in January and not delivered till May, there will be an interest charge from January to May. That's fair. So, if you had it in commercial storage, you would pay for storage and interest until delivery time. Well. When we organize that grain into the market, the first grain we're going to have to dispose of, of course, is, is warehouse stored grain. Uh, that would make sense. There's going to be, I'm sure, some priority. For an example, how many, uh, I hope, well, I shouldn't ask this. There are people, <laughs> let me say it that way, that took 1981 CCC reserve loans and did not take it as income and are doing the same with their 1982 crop. And if the call of both years' crop comes at the same time, 
they're going to be in a heck of a position. Now, I know that we don't like the idea of avoiding tax. None of us do that, right? Okay. However, there's going to be a need for some people to defer delivery because of potential tax liability. There are going to be people that don't want to go into the... End of side one, turn now to side number two.